Hi everyone. Thank you for joining today and welcome to part three of our Federal 101 training. Today we're going to talk about the actual federal application process and go into a little bit about how it differs from your normal application process. To begin, much like any organization, it, the application process uh, on its surface level follows pretty straightforward steps. The first thing you're going to do is identify positions that you think you are qualified for. The second will be to modify and upload your federal resume for each of those positions. So say there's 10 different positions that you would like to apply for in the federal government. You're going to have 10 different copies of a federal resume uniquely modified to each of those positions. Where it starts to get different is sometimes when you have to complete an application, you have to go through what's called an occupational questionnaire. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. And then fin finally, we'll kind of talk about what are the next steps in terms of following up with a hiring manager or things that um, vary from private sector. So the first step is to understand when you're looking at USA Jobs, what are you looking at? And this is taken from a job, um, an internship at the Forest Service from USA Jobs. And you'll see here where the red circle is, you're gonna try and understand what is the pay and scale and grade? And this is very important to students. You can also find the opening and closing dates here, the estimated salary, the work schedule, this is part-time, and it says that it's an internship. If you look a little bit further down, it says the location. So sometimes it will say multiple locations. This one is pretty specific. So what is this GS schedule and what does it mean? Basically, this tells you what levels that you are qualified for as a student. To qualify for a GS4 position, you need to have the associate's degree or similarly about two years of college level experience. For a GS5, this would be fantastic for all of you students who are going to be graduating um, soon. And GS5 is equivalent to four years, four academic years above high school leading to a bachelor's degree or a completed bachelor's degree. So say you're going to be a fifth year senior, you can still go for a GS5. GS7 is a bachelor's degree with one of the following. A class standing in the upper third of the class, which is proven through your transcript, a 3.0 higher or higher GPA, or a 3.5 or higher GPA major, and an honor society membership. And these are like the national honor societies. So for many students at Georgetown, they typically do tend to qualify for GS7 upon graduation. When you're looking at an internship, you're generally looking at a GS4 or a GS5 level. GS9 is the equivalent of a master's degree, and GS11 is the equivalent of a doctoral degree. Now, this is just talking about education. If you have additional work experience, say you're a more mature undergraduate student, or say you're a master's student who you've worked for a couple of years, you might be looking at some other higher levels, but this is for primarily undergraduates you're going to be looking at your GS4s and 5s for internships and no higher than a GS7 unless you've worked outside of school for a year or two or potentially more. The next thing is to try and understand what it is that you're looking at. Every job announcement in the federal government is constructed in the same way. You have duties, a summary section, responsibility, and um, sometimes it also has another link called a qualification. So this will kind of give you an idea of the summary is a high level. Now this can be really specific sometimes, some, but some positions, especially for an internship such as this, um, will be very vague. Responsibilities, again, this is an internship, so you're talking about how you're going to be trained, how you're going to be trained in doing different types of work, um, and it gives you some additional information. And we're actually gonna look at a live version of this to see if we can find some different examples. So again, usajobs.gov is the main place we're looking at. We're going to explore the student and recent graduates hiring tab. Scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. Do, 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 do. Let's search internship jobs. And this is late July of 2019. So we're starting to see applications already for um, different agencies for the fall and for the spring. So let's look at this. The offices of boards and divisions for the Department of Justice, a student volunteer intern. 
Now, this tells you that the open and closing dates are from April till September. GS00 typically means that this is an unpaid job, so that's why it has that location. Again, we talk about that, and here's the summary. So we talk about the duties of the Office of International Affairs at the DOJ, and then the responsibility the responsibilities. And here you can see that they have their own different things, like if you're an undergraduate versus a graduate student or a law school intern, and what they're kind of looking for in each of these teams. So this goes into you know specific departments within this agency. It says travel required supervisory status, like you're not going to be supervising anybody. Requirements, a lot of times this is where you get information about you must be a citizen, you have to go through some level of a security background check. Um, and additional information. Now qualifications, this is where you must be, this is where they get specific. You must be actively enrolled while participating in the internship and it tells you specifically who they're encouraging to apply. Um, they want students with a strong writing background and interest in international matters and criminal law may be particularly interested. That means it's not a given, but it's a good idea. Knowledge of foreign language is desirable, but not essential. Again, these are things that when you're thinking of writing your resume, if you hit any of these buttons and you're like, oh, that's me, that'll give you a leg up. Um, they also talk about some other things like equal opportunity. How you'll be evaluated is how well you meet the qualifications above. And typically what they mean is how well do you meet these qualifications here? And again, this is very generic. I've seen some federal government positions, they get very specific, and then also how you can say that you will fulfill the responsibilities. So what I like to tell students is on this page, you always wanna print this out, and anywhere where you can see a verb, go ahead and highlight that. So let's say you're looking at um, the policy coordination and its strategic engagement. You read this responsible for, for developing OIA's positions on policy, legislative, and multilateral matters and engagements, and serves as the coordinating authority for OIA by ensuring that a unified and consistent OIA position is developed for issues and activities involving more than one team. There's a heck of a lot, of one, one that's an awful round sentence. This is pretty common in government language. So what are you doing? You're one, developing positions. What else are you doing in college besides developing positions based on research, right? You're coordinating things. So anytime in a resume where you can show that you coordinated events, you coordinated um, information, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be around the specific topic issue, but like say you coordinated, um, you know, you're a member of the Grill Masters and you coordinate who's gonna buy the beef for every Friday's cookout. That's an example of coordination. And here at the end, for activities involving more than one team, are there examples, whether through your classwork or through your extracurricular things, where you're involved with a lot of different people and trying to coordinate among them and, and strategize? And this is all kind of how you can start to pull apart a position description and really try to understand what it means. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at here, and we'll go back to this presentation. Um, this is where, depending on your situation, where an additional one-on-one -on -one appointment can be helpful if you're looking at a very specific job announcement and you're not quite sure how to start. Um, but this is just kind of meant to show you what these different pieces are and how to start to interpret them. All right. The next thing is this thing we met, we, I alluded to earlier, an occupational questionnaire. So say you fill everything out, you get your federal resume for this particular job all set and ready to go and you upload it and you click submit. Sometimes they have what's called an occupational questionnaire. Usually it's way down at the bottom of the job description and you can actually preview what the questions are. For most student positions, for most student internships, it tends to be these questions here. One is, do you claim veterans preference? That is, are you a veteran? The second one is, are you enrolled full-time as you say you are? Yes or no. Um, occasionally for males, they will have uh, a question about, are you registered for the selective service or not? Um, and then here, for the one we were looking at earlier, for the Forest Service, they are saying, um, what location do you want to be considered for? So a lot of times at the undergraduate level, 
these questions are very vague. Um, when you get to more advanced positions, it's usually kind of a Likert scale of like, um, please explain how much experience you have. Let's say basket weaving. You're supposed to have two years of basket weaving experience. And your options will be, please say how, select what most closely describes you in terms of your basket weaving experience. One would be, I don't have any basket weaving experience. Two would be, I learned about it in a class. Three would be, I learned about it and applied it, and applied it in a classroom setting. Four would be, I apply it sometimes on the job and five is I apply it every day and I'm an expert. Um, it's generally on that type of scale. And for these questions, it's kind of seen as a back check to your resume to make sure that you are being truthful. If I haven't said it before already, please be honest. You want to put your best foot forward and you don't want to undersell your abilities by any means. So you, there are times where you could look at a skill set and say, gee, they want to see where I've collaborated. Well, I, I don't know that I've collaborated all the time, but I know I've a lot, done a lot of work on teams. When you're looking at the specific words they're using, go ahead and expand to the synonyms that also describe those words. Give yourself the benefit of the doubt, but do not be untruthful. Don't just hit the highest rating for every button um, because it will come back to bite you. And if you lie on a federal application, it's just bad news. It's unethical, but I mean, you, there's actually serious, more serious consequences with federal applications that um, you're in violation of federal standard uh, statutes, which can quite honestly put you in prison depending on the job. No pressure. <laughs> Speaking of no pressure, another thing to understand is oftentimes after you submit um, your application and after you can get what is sometimes called a uh, conditional offer of employment based on security clearance, um, you, will need, you will then receive in an email usually um, information to fill out an SF-85 or an SF-86 clearance. SF-85 is like non-sensitive, kind of your just generic background check, making sure there's no outstanding warrants for arrest, things like that. SF-86 clearance gets a lot more detailed and a lot of students here on campus really have a lot of questions about that process. Um, basically, if you're looking for a top secret or a top secret SCI clearance, um, they're looking for information that could be used against you to blackmail you into helping to serve as a double agent. So what do we look for things like that? The first thing that comes to mind is yes, drug use. And while things like marijuana are legal in the District of Columbia, marijuana is still considered a, a, a substance under uh, federal law. So if you have smoked pot, please stop smoking pot and wait at least a year, if not more, for some agencies. It doesn't bar you forever, but it bar does bar you temporarily. Similarly to that, I know that on a, a campus like Georgetown, there's a lot of pressure to do the best, and a lot of students turn to um, misuse of prescription drugs to try and stay on top of things. So maybe you misuse Ritalin or Adderall or some other substance. Maybe you have um, you know, an, an addiction to painkillers or something. Those are also considered, misuse of prescription drugs is also considered something that could block you from um, an SF-86. Again, if you have some bad habits, you wanna curb them now. If you need help, please go to CAPS and get the help that you need. Um, and again, it depends on where you're applying, but you want to have at least a year where you're clean. This also applies to underage drinking. If you've gotten a DUI or a minor in possession for some reason, that's all going to come out. So you want to be upfront and it could again delay your application. So just wait a year. These are all things that a lot of people, even people within government, even people within the high security levels of government understand happen, but you want to be upfront. Some other things that can kind of um, mess you up with a security clearance are um, lots of debt. If you say have a lot of credit card debt and you're not paying it down and you just, you know, you're missing payments and things like that, that can mess you up. Um, also foreign contacts. Now it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, I know lots of you go abroad. Um, what you're going to want to do is just keep track of the people that you make friends with, understand um, I always tell students to keep a list of like who your friends are when you go abroad, where they're from, what their address or email address is, and their birth date, because you're going to have to declare that all when you get back, especially if you stay in touch. Now, it's someone 
you met once and you're never going to talk to again. It's a little different, um, but they do try to keep track of uh, foreign contacts. I also have a lot of students who have foreign family members. Again, you're going to want to try and find out information about them because you are going to have to report on that. Um, so yeah, you're going to want to curb your bad habits now. You're going to want to stay out of debt or diligently repay it. If you've got student loans, that's fine, but stay on top of things. You must be completely honest. I know some students who have had um, various mental health issues um, and some of whom have uh, you know, dropped out of school from time to time, some of who have sought help or not, but maybe they, they know that they have some issues. You're gonna wanna declare all that. Um, actually, it's forbidden the federal government to discriminate um, upon basis of mental health. So that in and of itself isn't gonna deny you security clearance. However, if you lie about it, they find out about it, that can be enough to dissuade you. Um, but I have been told by many of our, our uh, recruiters that something like mental health alone won't necessarily disqualify you, but I've known students here who have not been truthful about it and it has come out and they have been denied security clearances as a result. So again, just be honest. If you're in doubt about whether or not to report something, just go ahead and report it and you know try and be as truthful and as honest. The whole process makes you feel like an awful human being, even if you're great. So, you know, hang in there. <laughs> so the next part, we're gonna talk about the federal resume. Um, but I will say that we will be having some employers come to campus over the next semester who will hopefully be doing some sessions on higher security clearances. Another great way to talk about the application process is um, to talk to some alumni. FOIA Gateway can be a wonderful way to look for some of this information. If you haven't checked that out, we can take a look at it right now. FOIAGateway.georgetown.edu. And, and you sign in using your own, um, your Georgetown ID. Um, you can browse the network. So let's say we're looking for someone who worked at the State Department. We can apply that. And these are all people that come up that either have worked there, have interned there. Um, not necessarily they're there now, but maybe they were in the past. So you wanna go ahead and you can reach out to these folks you can talk to them about the application process. You can come in and talk to the government nonprofit and education advisor. You can talk to some of your professors if you know that they've worked in the federal government. These are all different ways that you can have people help you look over your federal resume. Um, but we have a wonderful network of Hoyas that are out there that are doing this work. So don't get too discouraged. So, all right. Well, thanks, and we will see you back again to talk more about your federal resume. Take care.